Hello, everyone, and welcome to season three of the Courage to Identify podcast. And I'm your host, Sharon Angel. Today, we're going to talk about something that might be a taboo and something that might be controversial. And the reason why I want to talk about this is when we adopt a religion or when we adopt a certain faith, then we go into saying that these are the core values and hence you must believe it and hence you must pass those beliefs on to generation without questioning them. So what are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk about LGBT and can members of the LGBT community be Christians, can still have a faith? And how do others in the Christian faith who are not LGBT navigate relationships or friendships or even just existing in the same community together. There's so much hate on the news and on social media or even in Christian groups to say that you have to be straight or you have to be a certain kind of person in order to qualify as a Christian or in order to qualify as, you know, these religious norms or these to have these religious views. And I just want to open up that conversation and talk to this couple who have gone into marriage, who have stayed with that commitment and have still had struggles. So I just want to open up the conversation and leave you with the question, what qualifies you to be Christian or what qualifies you to be an individual who belongs to a certain faith? Let's have this conversation with April and Beecher. All right, we have April and Beecher here to talk with me about their story, the things that they went through. And really, the conversation that I want to have with them today is when they made the commitment to marriage, to stay married to each other, what did that look like, especially with different issues or different struggles that they had, they have to face together. So April and Beecher, welcome to my podcast. Hey, Sharon. Thanks for having us. Oh, this is great. Great to be here. Awesome. I'm so glad we're having this conversation. So just for my audience, we're referring to April as she, her, and Beecher as they, them. I'm so interested in hearing your stories and just give a different perspective to my audience. Let's start off with your story. Where did, I guess, like just your faith journey, how did it begin? Just opening the floor to you guys. April, maybe do you want to begin? Sure. So I was a preacher's daughter and my dad and my grandfather were actually both pastors. My dad was also an evangelist and have a very charismatic Pentecostal, non-denominational background. Um, uh, and very, my grandfather's church was like 4,000 members in the 90s in Dallas, which was before like mega churches were a huge thing. And then my dad was a Christian author, was on a lot of Christian TV, and I'd travel with my family and sing and sometimes be on different Christian TV shows, all of this stuff. So uh, my entire life was pretty much the ministry. And I was like, I'm going to grow up and I'm going to also be in the ministry and I was going to keep it going. So that's that's my background. Awesome. And Beecher. Yeah. So I grew up in, I would say, really kind of the first 10 years of my life, we were pseudo-religious, like we were Christians, we prayed, we went to church on Sunday, but that was kind of the extent. And then I enrolled in a Christian school for middle school. And for reasons that we'll get into later, I, I dove very hard into Christianity and fundamentalism and evangelical culture. Um, and so I was kind of the more most spiritual of my family. And I kind of like put, brought them all into a more spiritual kind of... Uh, world. And so grew up kind of non-denominational, kind of Baptist. And for college, I went to uh, Pentecostal uh, University. And so introduced the speaking in tongues and all, all of that kind of charismatic world. Um, but yeah, so I was I was a very fervent kind of diehard Christian with, um, you know, a few different denominational um, experiences growing up. Mm. So very similar to my experience growing up and very similar to a lot of my audience listeners growing up. After I listened to your podcast, The Non-Binary Marriage, I really wanted to get you guys on here and speak about your journey. So growing up in this conservative or very Christian traditional background, 
almost knowing where you have to be in life or want to be in life. Example, like being a preacher's kid. How was your dating life or when you both met each other, what was life like at that point? Yeah. So when Beecher and I met, we both grew up, you know, very deep in purity culture. And I had a purity ring and I had been to purity like altar calls in college and signed purity pledge cards and and all the things. And I had vowed to like save myself for marriage and Beecher as well. But uh, I mentioned this in my podcast, but when I was 21, I had gone on a date with a guy and um, was kind of sexually assaulted by him. And um, I remember uh, just really feeling so much shame and feeling really violated and re- realizing that purity culture teaches you to be pure, but never taught me about consent. Mm-hmm. And whether, you know, like I was feeling all the shame for something that I didn't choose to happen to me. And so that kind of threw me for a loop for a while. And I had kind of in my head kind of decided, you know, God, I don't know why I feel all of the shame and it wasn't going away. You know, I'd obviously had asked for forgiveness. I had asked God to forgive me, even though I was assaulted. But that was kind of what was taught a lot of times in purity culture. Like it was the woman's job to protect the men, like the men could lust and that they would stumble. And, you know, if if a man sexually assaulted me, it was somehow still my fault. But my dad ended up getting cancer and he passed away. And I legitimately thought that because I had had sex before marriage, that that was the reason God didn't heal him of cancer. So also dealing with that. So at this point, I had thrown myself kind of back into purity culture, thinking that God had somehow punished me for, you know, being scandalous, I guess, oh. and assaulted. And so when Beecher and I met, um, I had kind of dated a couple guys, but I had not done anything like sexual, was, you know, was going to save myself again, be a quote unquote secondary virgin was what they called it in my Christian college. Wow. I did yeah. not even know there was a term for that. Okay. Yeah. Um, one guy, a uh, preacher got up in chapel and said that he'd seen God restore girls' hymens so that they could be physical virgins for their husbands. So oh my goodness. Yeah. It didn't happen for me, but you know, apparently. Oh <laughs> so just for context sake, can you explain to my audience what purity culture is, especially from a woman's perspective? Sure. So I, it kind of became a really big thing in the 90s in youth group and early 2000s. Um, a guy named Josh Harris wrote this book called I Kiss Dating Goodbye. And it was just very much about, you know, you date only for the intent of marriage. And that book was about courting, which meant you don't actually date. You're never alone with the opposite sex. You're always in groups. It's very hyper-focused on sexual purity. Um, there, I never went to one of these, but I knew of balls that they would throw where a girl would dedicate her sexual purity like to her dad and they'd have these balls where they'd dance. And it was just really weird. And, um, you know, and, and it's, it's, it hypersexualized young girls. Like I remember being a child and being told I needed to cover up my shoulders because a man walking by could see them and lust after me and stumble. Mm. So you're just, as a girl, you're hyper aware of your body being a sexual object to every single Right. And also, and also seems like you're the object of temptation. Anything that you do say or the way you present yourself is the main reason why the opposite sex is um, being tempted or falling into sin. That's interesting. I'm sorry for what you went through. And I hope you're in a better place now. But yeah, lots of therapy and praying. Right. <laughs> and healing is important. Um, Beecher, what was it like for you? So I really can't talk about purity culture without getting into really some gender dysphoria that I started experiencing right about fifth grade when I tried on my sister's clothes and really liked it and didn't know why and it felt right. But then I was like, oh no, there's something wrong with me. And so the very, very quick story of it is basically I I, I knew I couldn't tell anybody. I started really doubting my gender. If I was supposed to be a girl, if I was a boy, if I was you know, trans, if I was, you know, just anything. Um, I, I knew I wasn't gay, 
but that was really like I knew I was attracted to girls, but in a kind of more emotional uh, than than visual way. Um, but uh, yeah, so it was sixth grade. I was I was I was having pretty bad panic attacks. My parents um, had a lot of stuff going on in their lives. They weren't really uh, necessarily able to show me a lot of attention. And so I'm there at this Christian school that I was a new kid at, and the the preacher at, at chapel was like, "Jesus can take your shame. Jesus can take your." Um, guilt and confusion and like, just give it to him. And so I was like, okay, I don't feel like I can give it to anyone else in my life. So I'm going to give it to Jesus. So I went down front and like was bawling. It was like, Jesus, my whole entire life. And like, I was basically making a deal with Jesus that like, you you can have everything if you just fix me. Like if you just fix this part of me that I am terrified of, and that I'm so afraid that I'm not going to ever be able to be around my family or friends. Like I won't it was just really, really scary. And so I gave it to Jesus. And then I asked that basically as I, as I went to church uh, more and as I, as I read more and as I heard, listened to more you know, sermons and all of that, I, I basically heard on sex and gender that uh, gender wise, there's boys and there's girls. And uh, on sex, you just have to stay pure until marriage. And so I kind of in my head thought, okay, I am going to be the best Christian possible. I'm going to like do all of that so and stay completely pure so that one one day when I get married, I'll finally feel like a normal guy and what the the what guys around me were telling me. And so that's one reason that I really dove into purity culture. But really what purity culture was for me, it was a shield because I was scared of my own gender, which worked itself also to being scared of my own sexuality because I'm not visually stimulated like like what guys were saying in locker rooms. And so I felt odd. I felt different. I did I didn't understand what was going on. And so, you know, I played baseball and basketball. And so like if I was in a locker room, you know, I had guys come up and show me on their phones like pictures of naked women. Like, look at this, look at this chick. And I'd just be like, sorry, I'm a Christian. I can't look at that. Really, what I'm realizing now, that was just a conscious way of me saying it was me being terrified that I'm not going to respond the right way because I don't know how guys are supposed to respond to that. And I think I'm supposed to be a guy. And so I'm just going to use the Christian purity culture as a wedge. And so I don't have to engage with that part of me. Well, we're talking about purity culture. And do you think this is to both of you, April and Beecher, do you think that came from a place of fear or inculcated in you from a point of fear? If you don't do this, you are not a good Christian. If you don't do this, you're not a good human. What is your perspective on that? Yeah, I would say it's very much fear-based. It's, you know, well, and it's also shame-based too. Mm -hmm. They put women's um, value and almost your worth in whether or not you're a virgin when you get married. Like, I don't know how many youth group sermon illustrations I went to where they had like a water bottle and they'd have five different guys spit in the water bottle. And then they'd ask, who wants to drink this? And they'd be like, ladies, that's how men will look at you if you have sex. And it was always focused on the women, less on the men, because men, it was like, oh, well, men have urges, like they shouldn't do it. But, you know, God can it forgive. It seems like they will be forgiven better right. or more if, rather than if women are sinful or if women tempt, tempts, yeah, the woman tempts a man. Oh, my goodness. How did that translate into your marriage or your dating season or your marriage? How did that translate? How did purity culture translate into that? A month into us dating, Beecher tells me that, um, oh, Beecher told me the story about when they were in fifth grade and put on their sister's clothes. Now, of course, at this point, Beecher's bawling and is telling me this, like they committed like the worst crime in the world. And I'm naive and I, neither of us had never, had ever even heard the term gender dysphoria. So we weren't even thinking that we were I don't really know what we were thinking, but what I heard was Beecher, you know, quote unquote, messed up when they were in the fifth grade. And I was like, well, have you like, do you want to be a woman? Because she's like, no, no, I just I just did it the one time. It's like, oh, you've never done anything since fifth grade. And Beecher's like, no, no, I haven't. But I thought I would like Beecher in through tears is like, I thought I would die with the secret. And I remember at the time realizing that it was a big deal to them because they had never told anyone. But in my head, I was like, this doesn't seem like that big of a deal. It was one time in fifth grade and we were in our 20s at this point. So 
Um, but I, I did tell you that I have thoughts. Uh, yeah. That I have thoughts and they just, they're just hard to control. And I was really afraid. And I mean, I told April is the first person I ever told. I'd mm-hmm. considered telling a few different people in my life, but never felt safe enough. And with April, when we started dating, she kind of told me everything. Like, yeah. Everything. First date, I told them I'm not a virgin. <laughs> like, I, I did the me, bad thing. I confessed all my sins. She told me everything. And so she was super vulnerable. Because I was going to ask why Beecher of all, like you had dated before. And sounds like April was the only girl that you wanted to share that with. So I was going to ask why April? Well, like why share that with only April? Yeah, no, I mean, it's a great question. And once again, I think it's because April led with such vulnerability for, in her own life. And then being at Sundance and just, and just, I mean, I'm 23. I just moved before this. I'd always lived within an hour of my family. So now I'm 10 hours from my family. So I felt, you know, I don't know. I, maybe I felt, uh, a little more independence that, that knowing words, not going to get back to my parents and not going to disown me and send me off to some camp or something. So, uh, you know, I, I think probably all that played a factor, but absolutely. I was in love with April a month into dating. And, mm-hmm. uh, when you're in love with somebody, you, they, they, they dig up parts of you that, that you have kept hidden from a lot of other people. So the interesting thing that happened after Beecher told me is that now the secret was out. And so Beecher started dealing head on with their gender dysphoria, but we still ha- didn't have language. We didn't know what was happening. And initially how it came out was it was projection, but they would kind of blame me for not being a virgin on the fact that they were having such a hard time. It it psychologically makes it made sense like looking back on it, but in the moment we were like, what what the crap is happening? Um because once again, as I'd mentioned, like the deal I'd made with God, like I had stayed pure in April hadn't, which now, of course, is this we know this none of this was her fault. And I've completely moved past any ill feelings towards April's. Right. But at the time I thought like I didn't mind the market. Why am I going insane right now? Why am I not able to sleep? Why am I having panic panic attacks for the first time since sixth grade? Oh, it must be because April wasn't didn't you know didn't do the deal. Did it save didn't her deal. for me? Yeah, and, yeah, and it was, and so well. And you had also hoped that you would find your virgin wife, and that the vir- you know features virgin wife would save them from whatever was going on. Yeah, absolutely. It was, but it was also really scary knowing that she'd been with guys or a guy because once again i'm so insecure mm. that i'm like what if on our honeymoon night i don't function properly and uh really having a hard time because every time i went to the bible i felt like jesus would be like forgive like like you know i, I had a very hard time standing on my feelings um with what the bible said and so we stayed together mm-hmm. well we almost broke up several times oh, and several but times. we we fast we we took a week where we didn't see each other and we fasted and we prayed and anytime we would pray about it we both felt no god wants us to stay together and so we kept staying together do you think at that point in your dating period leaving would have been easier yes yes yeah definitely i mean i definitely think so i mean once again i was going to go back in my it's a secret no one knows i'm just going to act like a normal you know cisgender guy um and be alone forever so yeah i think it would have been easier so when we decided to keep dating you know we were like well we need to figure out whatever this is Mm. um beecher started seeing a therapist and we for a while thought thought it was three demons first well yeah after after i realized it's not april like this isn't april this is something going on with me Right. Then, and I went to a very Christian uh, therapist because that's what I was wanting at the time. And she's amazing. And I love her. And I'm. She was what you needed so at the time. Great. She's exactly yeah. what I needed at the time. But she and I kind of settled on it's three demons. And here's what their names are. And here's what I got to do to get rid of them. And got to and write in tongues. I'm the Pentecostal in the relationships. So I'm like, oh, I can cast out a demon. Yeah. <laughs> so but then it goes to the casting out demons. I mean, Beecher asked me, so it was consensual, but Beecher asked me to lay hands on them and cast out the demons. Like I was speaking in tongues, trying to cast these demons out and, oh, did I mean, nothing happened. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I mean, so knowing those three demons was easier to navigate the relationship or what made it easier? It just, it seemed like 
I don't know that we ever felt like the demons went away. I think we just settled on like, maybe it wasn't three demons. We don't know what this is, but. Beecher what were the flash demons, can I ask? Um, yeah, well, we thought it was, this is what we I thought at the time. It was I like, I'm pretty sure it was a demon of perversion, of shame, and lust. Lust. Yeah, because you're the first woman that I was really, really wanting to have sex with. You're the first woman that I really wanted yeah. to have sex with. Which again, that's, that's what it. we thought. It would, mm-hmm. I, so it wasn't true. It's just normal sex drive that just woke up in me when I was 23. That's right. As opposed to 13. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and it, I, it was, I felt like it was evil, you know, it was wrong. Um, right. So, okay. Yeah. Um, and I think too, just the more we talked about it, I mean, there's still sh- some shame there, but mm-hmm. Beecher was just starting to function at a more normal level. I mean, I did hard level. therapy. Uh, it was a really intense time. Uh, right. My entire life was pretty much devoted to fighting this and getting mentally okay. Um, but I feel like we we got there enough that we got engaged that following fall and we got married. So you moved past, I guess, individual struggles of shame, um, sexual pleasures, or even the fear of that, the temptation of lust, um, and having each other talking about it, dealing with it, having conversations sounds like it really helped. But what was marriage like when you really committed, made those vows, um, really had that ceremony? What was life like after? So our marriage, like our relationship has always been really good. Like we're we're best friends, like our doing life together was really easy. And we got along superbly in that area. Sex was a little more challenging because we found ourselves, Beecher was trying to fulfill this like role of the the husband, you know, and like, oh, husbands want sex all the time. And if they're not getting a certain amount of sex, then the marriage is bad. And so kind of putting that pressure on me. And then I was also feeling the pressure because I had been taught, oh, a good wife makes sure you know, that her husband is fully satisfied sexually. And it doesn't really matter if I am or not, or if I even want to, you know, I mean, I remember going to women's events in church at at like 12 and them teaching like, all right, ladies, you know, there's going to be times your husband wants sex and you don't want to, but you should put out anyway, because that's what the Lord wants. And so- They taught you that? They said- Oh, yeah. Yes. Oh, my goodness. It was like a Band-Aid. And once again, if- if the, all the church ever told me was, if you stay pure in all marriage, don't deal with this. You get married, you have the most amazing sex ever. Well, the sex wasn't the most amazing ever. Was it? I, no, it was not. And so... It was- well, and it also kept, you know, with my previous assault and already feeling like an object from coming through purity culture, the amount that Beecher was wanting it. And then if I, if we didn't have it enough, them feeling like, like our marriage wasn't good or that I wasn't being a good wife, like that was just kind of feeding into but the enough. shame that was already there. Yeah. And then also if she if she was not willing to meet this the level of sex that I was asking for, if I was then tempted by putting on women's clothes or 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 presenting more feminine or anything like that, I can blame her because she's the one that's not fulfilling her role enough. So that's why this demon's back bothering me. Mm. Uh so it's so twisted. And at the time it's very I very unhealthy. I don't think we could have we, we could not have verbalized it as we have now, but we've done a lot of therapy and in the past 10 years. This is 10 years ago. I mean, this is, this is, or I guess nine years ago. Well, and at this point too, um, early on in our marriage, Beecher's working full time at this large church and there's no one that we can talk to about this. Like I, I would come home sometimes and Beecher would confess to me like, hey, you know, I put on your dress today. I feel really bad about it. I'm going to try not to do it again. And I was like, oh, okay, well, I don't, don't do that. You know, like I didn't know how to handle it. I didn't know what it was. I didn't have anyone to talk to. You know, if we'd kind of hinted at it to people that we knew, it would just be like, oh yeah, well, that's definitely a demon. Everything you've been taught in church or like one of the the core philosophies is not working. How did you deal with that? Did you ever think this is not a demon and we have to approach it in a different way? Yeah. Yeah. So we started initially, we kind of said, okay, this is not a demon. This is just something that's a part of you. Like we're like, maybe your brain's wired, weird. We don't know. But eventually we were just like, well, maybe it's just like a fetish. Maybe it's like a 
or like, or an addiction to women's clothes. Like you're just mm-hmm. you just you have like some people are drawn to alcohol, you're drawn to women's clothes, and you know. So let's just put a practical measures in place that I cannot get to those clothes, and that will solve it. And so, like I couldn't be if for a season I couldn't be in the apartment. Alone. And so, and and like, we just would do things like, and I would always tell April every time I'd pass up or get in anything. Um, But for the most part, you just do uh, really out there things to avoid. If there was a trans character on a TV show, we always turned it. If there was a trans, if there was a trans person out and about, basically go somewhere else. And not because I necessarily had anything against them, but I was so triggered um, because I was so jealous of them being able to express uh, themselves mm-hmm. in spite of what society was, who, who society was telling them to be, mm-hmm. um, that I, I couldn't handle it. And well, so, and it had never crossed our mind that Beecher could be trans or non binary. It well, maybe it crossed no, your mind, it definitely it crossed never crossed mind. my mind because I, I was living in denial. I think the first few years that we were married, that like, oh, this is just Beecher's problem, mm-hmm. I'll figure it out. I mean, when I was 15, I, I found out about trans people and I prayed, like, God, am I trans? Am I supposed to medically transition? So, I I had had those. I mean, yeah, I had had those thoughts um, for sure. But the thing that I kept coming to is I didn't really want to live full time as a woman. Tell us more about that Beecher, because on the outside, what we hear about trans people is they would know at a certain age, and you know if they were born male and want to be female, or if they're born female and want to be male, they want to go through that transition because they cannot live with themselves being a different gender. Does that happen to everybody? And also talk to me from a point of, you were going to therapy, so did you ever discuss this in therapy? Or did you look up Google and say, I have to do certain things? Like, did those things dictate your decision? Yeah, so great question. The first thing I'll say is, I, on this journey, since I've come out, as non-binary in the past few years uh, and met a lot of trans people. Every every trans person's story is very different. So mm-hmm. I'm not going to talk for the entire trans community. Um, I didn't look at myself in the mirror. So uh, like before high school, I would get up and I would tell people, oh yeah, I was just really, I'm just really tired in the morning. So like I would go in, wash my face, brush my teeth, all with the lights off because I don't want to see myself because I can't handle that. So I was living underground for like 28 years. And now I'm living above ground. And the thought of going back down there is excruciating. Like, I don't know how I, I don't know how I survived. You just kind of do it. Um, and well, it's really difficult. It's not fun. Did you ever want a confirmation from someone to say, um, you look good as a man or you look good as a woman? Um, did you ever want validation? So I used... As far as the look good as a man, I use validation if anyone said I was handsome, which that was the only compliment that any guy ever gets from anyone ever. Um, but, you know, when someone would say that, I would use that as a, okay, I'm pulling it off. Like I'm, okay, the mask is working. Okay, they're not on to anything they don't know. So I don't, I mean, in the moment when you're hiding and you're scared to death, you see it as a good thing. But looking back, it's not, I mean, you the compliment that is actually aimed at me when I'm expressing myself genuinely, exa- exactly how I see myself and, and feel, uh, is worth a hundred times more than a compliment on a mask that you're wearing, if that makes sense. You mentioned uh, mask so, a couple of times. So for 20 years, you were wearing a mask and you felt like you had to? I definitely felt like I had to. I mean, I, there was there was no, I mean, I didn't see any world that I, I didn't know a single trans person. I didn't know a single uh you know, uh, this is different, but any, any drag queens, I didn't know anyone that played in the world of gender. Um, I was, it was, I was alone, you know, there was, there was a family friend that came out as gay and I heard about it and he was around a lot until he came out as gay. And then I never saw him again. It was a family member who was around a lot, family reunions, all that fun stuff. He came out as gay and then I never saw him again. Uh, so it wasn't stated that if you're, you know, queer LGBTQ that like you'll disappear, but that's I knew two people that was them, and they both were a part of my family and friend groups, and then they suddenly weren't. And so that's the only, you know, there was nothing ever said. Uh, so I remember you said that you felt like if you were to come out or if people were to really know you, 
that you would have to disappear to. Oh, yeah. I don't want to be around. Yeah, I thought our parents would send me away. They wouldn't have any, you know, my friends wouldn't, wouldn't. Yeah, I just thought, thought I'd be alone. I mean, that was, that was the number one prayer that I prayed in, uh, you know, middle school, high school, college was, God, please just don't let me be alone. That was, that was the most recited prayer ever um, in my prayer life by a lot. Um, I'm sorry. Because we all, as humans, nobody wants to be alone. Nobody wants to feel alone. Yeah, I would say, I think where, at least for me, where I realized we needed to make a change is I started seeing Beecher go to this a really, really dark place. Now our marriage get getting very depressed. And they wouldn't always show that side to me, but it would come out, you know, every now and then. And I remember there was one night Beecher just got very vulnerable with me and was bawling and basically just said that they don't think they would be able to stay alive if things didn't change. And I believed them because when we were dating, there was another time too where uh, they had texted me that they were walking out into the ocean and they were going to go as far as they could and not come back. And I knew, I just, and I, at this point, I had learned enough to know that um, suicide rates are very, very high um, in trans people, especially trans people that are not loved and are not affirmed. And I just, I kind of had hit this point where I was, was like, I would rather have my spouse alive and address than dead in men's clothes. And that was kind of when I started taking it more seriously of like, okay, this isn't a fetish. This isn't something like, this is something that I can't just act like his features thing. Like if I want to keep my spouse alive, we've, we've got to figure this out. And I basically, we, April and I both said about, you know, three, four years ago, right. Kind of the beginning of the pandemic, like, Beecher, we've got to get you in a, or that I've got to get into a, uh, a therapist who is a Christian, but also specializes with gender identity. Um, and so that's when I, I got connected with an amazing therapist out of Chattanooga, just 30 minutes from my house. And that really started the path to figuring out myself, finding myself. And it took probably four or five months before I felt really realized I was non-binary and then it felt right. One well, we we had been kind of talking and praying too. And we're like, you know, God doesn't give us a spirit of fear. And we had kind of decided like we shouldn't make decisions based on fear. And we realized that we were afraid to ask, to really ask the question of what is this in case this wasn't an identity thing. Like we just were terrified of what that answer would be. And we just kind of agreed like we we just need to know like we can decide once we know what we're going to do with that but we can't be like we can't be afraid to ask the question and so uh, we powerful did. powerful but did that reality of i might lose my spouse i might lose my i might lose beecher change anything for you as a wife yeah i mean it was I, I had so much fear. So I had a lot of my own issues too with just my own sexuality and wanting to enjoy sex. And I still dealt with a lot of shame. So I wanted to go to therapy for that, but also just to have someone to talk to about, um, you know, having a spouse that was going through a gender, just gender issues. And one thing that my therapist told me to do that was helpful and hard was she told me to kind of have a memorial for the husband that I had married, that I had thought I had married, to just kind of say goodbye to that Beecher because that's not who I'm married to now. Um, and it's not that Beecher like played a trick on me or anything. Like neither of us knew. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, it was definitely really hard because I had all these preconceived notions of what a husband is and what a wife is. And if Beecher is not, you know, a fully a man like what does that mean for me being a woman and, and being a wife and you know I had all these questions and and there there was a lot of fear and of the unknown but any time I'd see Beecher like I saw them get happier and happier and have more and more peace the more they discovered this side of themselves and the more they let this side out that I knew I couldn't argue with their transformation. Like I felt like 
and I've I've said this to Beecher too, but I really feel like seeing Beecher go from so repressed and shelled up to liberating themselves to be their authentic true self and be um like their true god-given identity was like was such a divine experience Mm -hmm. that i could not deny um, in our marriage or anymore right now sounds like beecher's freedom is what perpetuated you to turn from denial to acceptance of yourself of beecher of who both of you were are in the marriage um now you have kids you have two beautiful girls how do they play into this how do they look at both of you yeah so they're still we have um, a six-year-old and a three-year-old and our six-year-olds only kind of started to understand like they they know that Beecher is non-binary they don't our oldest has somewhat of an understanding of what that is but we've try to be intentional even from the beginning you know like there's no boy things and there's no girl things there's just things like if you like this toy it doesn't matter Mm -hmm. if it's you know labeled a boy toy or a girl toy like that should just be you know you just should like what you like um but like honestly our life's just super normal like and i i think and i had to get through this in in counseling um even a couple years before i even came out like before i knew who myself was um, and it was, you know, the idea of, oh my gosh, I'm going to ruin my daughter's lives. Like, you know, like if I come out as LGBTQ, like what is it going to mean for them? And what it came to with talking to April, my therapist, and everything else, I'm like, they're going to grow up in a such an, um, with a, <laughs> with a significantly more emotionally healthy parent if I'm expressing myself and being who I want to be. And also, and this was probably the kicker when I talked about this with my therapist, like, if our two daughters go through anything like I went through, I, I want them to know that they can express themselves. I do not want them to feel like they're alone and I do not want to feel like they can't talk to us. Do they need a father who is mentally healthy and um, sound or do they need a father who is unhappy and just depressed and not contributing? Uh, because right. I think in a girl's life, a father is very important. That's That's good. I'm glad you said that. Now that you've come out... Uh, publicly and both of you, especially with the podcast, really shared with your audience where you are, what, how your marriage is. Um, how is it with your friends and family? Because it's one thing to kind of navigate your immediate family, like your spouse and your children. But when it goes to extended family and some of your close friends, I think making a decision like this, um, making a personal choice like this can be difficult Um, What was it like for you both? Two years ago when I came out to friends and family, I called called my friends and my family members that I was close enough to, to tell them the story and to be open and honest. And all of them have really stood by me and been amazing. It's more of like that next generation, ne- that next generation or next group of people, the the family members you only see at family reunions. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. you don't have that relationship outside. Mm-hmm. Those are the ones that are like, oh, well, it's just because Beecher watched The Walking Dead. It's like that, that was, that's what one. Yeah, that, that's an actual said. theory. She wrote a letter saying that she knows why Beecher's non-binary. It's because he, he, she used he, but he watched The Walking Dead when he was at my house. And a, a demon came out of the TV and got him yeah oh, so though and like my cousin that's crazy and a prepper and you know all these things messaged april on, on instagram with the bible first about how men shouldn't wear women's clothes the reality is once i actually sit down and tell my story it's a lot like what they say in church of like you know your testimony is the best thing you can do to witness to pe- people because your testimony they can't argue with and they can't take anything away from and my testimony really is like i was miserable I did everything the church told me to. None of it worked. As my as my last resort, I expressed myself genuinely and and sought help. And I'm happier and more at peace than I've ever been. But the point is, is that whenever I can actually get into a room with someone and tell my story, or they actually listen to my podcast, they are only happy for me. Mm-hmm. And the people that want to not engage with me and just make comments from the sidelines are the people that throw the grenades, so to speak. Right. Um, because they don't want to engage. They don't want to actually hear a story. Just throwing scripture at us. They just right want to the nice say, here's this, you're going to hell, and please don't talk to us, right? Because they know 
subconsciously or consciously, that if they sit down and hear my story and see us as humans, that they're going to have to rethink the pain they've caused so many people in the LGBT community um, leading up to this. And that is too painful of a thought for them to register. And so they just want to give the verse and then never see me again. Because that's work on their end and they're not ready to do that. And this happens especially to April when you're so open on TikTok and Instagram. Um, I am so, I mean, the courage that you have, the tenacity that you have to take on these people and laugh about it is amazing. Because I see your, the way you just, you know, throw it back to them, give it back to them and be like, okay, you said this. It's it's amazing. But what is one of the worst things that you've heard? Um, because most of them who are combating some, some of the things that you say are Christians. They come from a very spiritual background. What are some of the worst things that you've heard? And how do you deal with that? I mean, it, it can get really dark. I mean, I've I've had messages of people, you know, wanting to kill my communist kids. Um, you know, like awful. As a conservative evangelical Christian, very in the church. Yeah. Um, I felt like I was going to be able to do so much ministry and help so many people, but it just I it was always forced, it didn't happen. Now that I've come out, I've gotten the most persecution that I've ever gotten. And I've been able to minister, so to speak, to so many people that have reached out after listening to the podcast and they say, oh my gosh, I thought I was the only one. And I can message them and tell them, it's okay. It's all right. Like, you're not going to hell over this. Like, I love you. Jesus loves you. Like, I'm able to just like speak into their life. It's not like I'm saying anything that out there. I'm just saying, you're not alone. And it's been amazing. And one thing that's been a goal of ours too um, you know, I grew up, our family was homophobic. Our whole church was homophobic and, you know, transphobic, all all the phobics. Um, and I feel like I now, like my calling, so to speak, is to kind of undo the harm that I used to perpetuate towards the queer community and to just like normalize the fact that you can be queer and be a Christian. And like those things are not mutually exclusive. Beautiful. What would you say to weaponized religion? Um, now we're in, in the U.S., it's coming to a point where people are against LGBT if they are Christian to say that you cannot teach this in school, you cannot use these words. And I even met someone who said, um, I won't support the LGBT community because they want me as a heterosexual man, as a straight man to become LGBT. I think there's so much misinformation um, and I think there's so much hate and hostility because the church has taught them certain things or parents have taught them certain things, uh, different biases. How do you navigate that? What would you say to someone who is trying to find their identity, find freedom and really live their whole self? Yeah, that, that's a loaded question. <laughs> um, I feel like, you know, one, I try to remind myself that a lot of these people that are being so nasty and hateful, even in the name of God, are very indoctrinated themselves and very misinformed and ignorant on the issues. And so I try to have grace and, you know, remember where I was. I was also ignorant and misinformed mm -hmm. and all of those things too. But, you know, at a certain point, if someone's not willing to listen to our story or, you know, to have a conversation, and just wants to come in, spew their hatred, vitriol, their talking points and, you know, and and leave. Boundaries are really healthy and mm. could, could be a really good thing too. Um, because at the end of the day, like it was reading the the words of Jesus, the red letters, Jesus's teachings that were such a contrast to the modern American, like the white American evangelical church. It was just like, okay, what Jesus is saying is the opposite of what we're doing. Like the the hate, the, you know, putting people in the margins and discrimination, like none of that is of Jesus. I mean, I, we live in Tennessee. They're literally passing some horrible bills um, aimed at LGBTQ people. Um, and so I want to first note the seriousness of that and yeah. the families' lives that are really going to be impacted by these and why it's so important for people to speak out and to vote and to be politically active. But what I would also say is if there's people out there 
that approach me and want to have a big political conversation about LGBTQ issues, I like to take the conversation much more personal because the reality is, is that these people, if they have these opinions, they're going to have a friend or a family member come out as LGBTQ at some point in their life. The, number, the, st- the statistics are there. And it's much more, okay, what are you going to do in that instance when it's your daughter coming out as LGBTQ, mm-hmm. when it's your best friend? People are going to continue to be themselves. They're going to continue to be authentic. And I just really hope those that are weaponizing Christianity against LGBTQ in that moment where that loved one uh, comes out to you, that you have the love and patience and peace to actually go and confront the issue for the sake of that relationship. And if that keeps happening, then public opinion is going to keep changing. And to see, you know, queer people as human and not as some political, you know, talking point. But like, these are people. Beautiful. Well said. Thank you so much for joining me. And April and Be Sure together have a group. When I heard about it, I just thought it was like a group where they're open to inviting and welcoming outcasts or the neglected. Do you guys want to share about that a little bit? Yeah. So from the podcast, we had so many people reach out. Um, Most of the people grew up in evangelical backgrounds and are either identifying LGBTQ in some way or they have a spouse, yeah, a spouse or a partner who's identifying that way. And so it's a safe place for us to ask questions, be real. It's a Discord channel. We have a Patreon on Um, But if anyone's interested in that, I definitely would say go listen to the podcast, The Non-Binary Marriage. And uh, at the end, we explain more about the group because that's really the only thing um, that that is the kind of gateway to being accepted in the group is just, have you listened to the podcast? Did something resonate with you? If yes, um, there's a lot of other people that are feeling the same way and we would love to do life with you. Thank you guys so much. I love that you're living in freedom, um, showing that freedom of choice, uh, even though there's consequences, you can navigate that. And um, the commitment that you made at the altar, you're still holding on to that regardless of what has happened in your marriage. Thank you for being an example. Thank you for being kind and gracious to really open up and share with me. I learned a lot today and I hope my audience can pick up on a few things as well. Um, Follow April and Beecher. Thank you both so much for being on my podcast. Thank you so much for having us. Yeah, this was great. Thank you. And that is our conversation with April and Beecher. And I hope you were able to kind of formulate your answer or your thought for the question I had asked earlier when we started this episode to ask what qualifies a person to belong to a certain religious group or religious identity? And is it okay to seclude a person or isolate a person or treat them as an outcast or neglected just because you or a certain community of people don't want to be alone, don't want to feel lonely. That's another question that we need to ask ourselves, especially when we're on this journey of finding our own identity, maybe even formulating our own identity from whatever is different from the past. I think that's an important question to ask. And I hope this conversation was beneficial, useful to you and just, you know, triggered some questions in you. And with that, we come to the conclusion of episode two of the Courage to Identify podcast. There will be more episodes, so please do continue to listen. Follow me on social media and also on SharonAngel.com to be a part of some of the events that I uh, go to and the speaking engagements that I'm invited to. There will be another episode coming up, so I will talk to you soon.